Thank you very much, Sharon. I'm going to start off with the first talk today and give kind of a lay the background, lay the framework for why we believe this is such an important issue for all of us that, are, that practice medicine. And this is not just a United States issue. This is, as I talk to people around the world, I think that we're seeing similar issues relative to what's appropriate utilization and, and uh, what are the drivers in healthcare reform really around the world. Uh, I have no disclosures. I'm going to start off with a definition. Test utilization is really a strategy for performing appropriate laboratory and pathology testing with the goal of high quality, cost effective patient care. I've underlined those key words. Those are really the key words. Strategy, appropriate, quality, cost effective patient care. Laboratory tests in the United States account for approximately 4% of total health care costs, but conventional wisdom when people have done studies, including one that came out in POLOS from out at, in Boston earlier this year, is that 20 to 40 percent of laboratory testing is probably unnecessary and does not contribute directly to the care of patients. Take that together with where a major increase is coming, which is in the molecular and genetic area. We're seeing a 20 to 25 percent increase in costs throughout our system. It used to be as unusual to get laboratory tests that cost more than $1,000. For all of us that have association with hematology and oncology, we know now we're seeing $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 assays. And so the world is changing, and we need to be able to respond to that. I'm going to use this slide to really kind of lay what I think is really one of the most important things that we need to think about in this whole process. Dr. William Osler, considered the father of modern medicine, came back with this quote. And I think when, it's always brilliant when a quote that came from the, you know, probably over 100 years ago is still relevant today. Medicine is a science of uncertainty and the art of probability. If you think about why we order tests, how we deal the, with the evaluation of patients, this really says, says it all. Dr. Claude Shannon from MIT was considered the father of modern information theory, and his dogma always was information is a resolution of uncertainty. So I think it's really critical that we think about how we use data to be able to help deal with the uncertainty that we all have when dealing with the patients that we try to take care of. I think there's a philosophical challenge out there with clinical laboratory utilization, which is how can we help our clinicians deal with the reality of uncertainty with laboratory and pathology testing? Medicine is all about being comfortable with degrees of uncertainty. You can never get to zero uncertainty. There's always one more test to do. There's one more thing to do. And, you're, and we all know we have colleagues that search for that zero uncertainty. You have to find that sweet spot because there's always one more test to do. So we have to use our knowledge, we have to use our information to be able to lo lower that anxiety of uncertainty, and that information is really our trump card. What's that mean practically? I think it's really critical as pathologists, for the pathologists and laboratorians that are in the room, that we need to understand the clinical problem. Pathologists have to act like clinicians. For my hematology colleagues out there, you need to expect your pathologist to understand the clinical situations that we're dealing with. It's really critical that we have deep knowledge of diseases and the clinical issues so that we understand how to use the laboratory in today's world. And as laboratorians and pathologists, as we interact with our clinical colleagues, we have to change the question from, do you do test X, Y, Z, to, can you help me solve this clinical problem? As clinicians, I think that's what you need to expect from pathologists, and as pathologists, this is how we need to be thinking when we're dealing with our clinical colleagues. So how does utilization fit into our current healthcare environment? Healthcare delivery is changing. I think we're seeing it everywhere around the world. More and more primary care is being done in non-traditional settings. Guess who the, what people, the experts say, uh, who will be the major three providers of primary care in the United States by 2020? Here they are, right here. You know, it's, and Target just came out. They're setting up their minute clinic, you know, equivalents. CVS just signed an agreement with Epic to put Epic in all their stores to be able to deal with information that they deliver. You have Theranos partnering when trying to provide point-of-care testing within, the, within their stores. Healthcare is changing. 
we all know from our environments that we work in how that employer insurance market is, is changing with ACOs, public and private exchanges, contracts between major employers and providers. The world doesn't look like what it is, was when I started out 20, 25 years ago. This is a study I think is really uh, relevant to, to all of us that deal with oncology and hematology type issues. This was a study that was published in that noted medical journal, the Minneapolis Star and Tribune. Uh, and uh, in it, they, what they talked about, this was a study that United Health, the largest insurer in this country, did with about, I think it was three or four or five oncology groups in Atlanta. They looked at 810 patients with breast, lung, and colon cancers. They basically gave flat fees to the oncologist in those groups to take care of these 810 patients. It wasn't just a single fee, it was based on the type of cancer, the stage of cancer, and where they were in their particular course of disease. And what they came in was that there was a reduction of approximately, as you can see in the third bullet item over this three-year study, a reduction of approximately $40,000 per patient. It was basically a 30% drop. And uh, Regardless of what you think, if you think that United Health just shelf this and said, oh, this is interesting, and not do anything about it, and if you don't think the Etnas and the Cygnas and the Humanas haven't picked up on this, you're crazy. Without a doubt, this is where we're headed, you know, moving from that fee-for-service environment to value-based payment in, uh, services. With that as background, let's ask the question, do we have utilization issues in hematology? This doesn't deal with hematology, but this is just to point out the geographic variation that occurs in patient care around this country. This is the percent of cancer patients receiving chemotherapy during the last two weeks of life. It comes from the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare. And all you got to do is just take a look and you see all the variations in color. And if I think about where I grew up here in southwest Iowa, we were always influenced by Omaha. Look at the different color versus Des Moines versus Kansas City, St. Joe versus Lincoln. Go out to, to out here and you can see that what's driven by Kalispell versus the rest of Montana. Look at California. You can see how much that we as professionals, how we drive the cost of care within our particular region. A few years ago, Dr. Curtin, who you'll hear from next, and I really started paying attention to uh, uh, all the ordering that was coming from our hematology colleagues. And this is a case that we, uh, that we routinely see on a daily basis. A patient comes to Mayo, they bring their work up with them. One look at the bone marrow and a straight up diagnosis of a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And looking at the, at the paperwork that came with the patient, here were all the studies that had been done on that patient. But when you really stop to look at it, these were the only things that were needed. And thousands of dollars had been done on this patient, which were really unnecessary in the workup of their patient. We then started to work with our colleagues, went through a variety of tests, developed algorithms and guidelines, and I'm not going to walk through all of these, but all you have to do is see what the most common word is over in that right-hand column, overordered. So if we have an issue and the environment is changing, we need to understand why we have a problem. Well, all of us are contributing, whether it be providers, labs, patients, health systems. I'm not going to really run through all of these. I'm going to mention a few of these in the next page. Uh, from the lab side of things, our processes, our names, how we bundle things doesn't help. Health systems like the dollars that come from the laboratories. So it's, it's an important to, to maintain financial viability. Our EMRs don't help. Nobody likes their ordering system. Nobody loves their lab systems. Patients, more is better. Google, the source of all medical knowledge. I hear my, my clinical colleagues talk about patients coming in with reams and reams of paper that they've printed off of Google as to what disease they have, how they want to be treated, clinical trials that they want to go on. Google is, 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 has its uh, a contribution to this process as well. This is a really important slide because if we're going to deal with a problem, we need to understand why we have a problem. There clearly is a knowledge gap between clinicians and how to use today's increasingly complex laboratory tests. And patients may not see a specialist that has a deep understanding of the disease that that patient may have. Most importantly, clinical knowledge at the time of test ordering is incomplete. 
the clinician is compelled to order everything as it may be the only chance that they have to see that patient or before that patient gets treated. And although initial laboratory and pathology studies could help narrow, if laboratories don't have a process to review those orders, clinicians have no choice but to order excess testing. And again, the fee-for-service environment clearly does not encourage appropriate use. So how do we address these issues? Um, I'm going to run through these relatively quickly. There's a whole variety of things that one can do. You need to understand what, uh, I guess, what the bottom line with all of this is. You need to know your resources. You have to have champions both in the laboratory and on the clinical side. Your IT systems have to work for you, and that can be a challenge. And I, and I think too many times we try to aim for perfection, and I always say any progress is good progress as we try to deal with this issue. There's a lot of tools out there. People always think education is the way to go. You know, I have laboratorians come, lab techs, and they'll say, will you please email Dr. So-and-so and tell them to quit doing this ordering? And it's like, emails don't work. Education has very limited lasting ability. It has a short-term impact. But giving lectures to clinicians on how to do things really won't change how things get done. But laboratories have to put in processes that deal with the frequency of ordering and, it, and put in some gatekeeper type things. We've clearly spent time looking at our templates that our docs use in the hospital and in the clinics. We've gone to beginning to put in order entry pop-ups and other decision support tools. And again, uh, developing a test formulary for a high cost test is a critical step. Test names don't help. I mean, if you were a busy clinician and here's all of our BCR able tests that we have, quick, which one do you want to order? And you're busy and you're backed up. And somebody at the desk is hollering at you as to which test, which BCR able test do you want to do? In other words, we don't make it easy for clinicians from the laboratory side of things as well. Labs need to unbundle. A lot of, most laboratories do flow cytometry and do large consistent panels of 20 to 30 antibodies. We use a triage approach. We start off with a limited number of antibodies, use what we know about clinical history and by what we look at the slide and, then, and the initial triage results from the flow, and then decide what to do. There's no point in doing blast markers in somebody who has CLL. There's no point in doing, you know, it's, you know plasma cell markers in, some, in a, in a two-year-old that has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And because of that, this is data that we got from uh, Care Corps from Mike Astin at University of Washington. And this is really kind of distribution of the uh, cost of uh, flow cytometry per patient visit by laboratory. And this is laboratories across the country. You can see where we fall and clearly look at the differences in the cost of how people approach flow in patients that use probably a triage type approach as opposed to a one size fits all. We use a send and hold process where, we, where the most critical thing is let's make sure we get the specimen drawn. Let's make sure we get it to the lab. Let's hold it in the lab. Uh, and then we build systems as to determining how do we use that particular specimen. For example, let, you know, make sure you have a specimen for flow cytometry, lymphoma staging, but let's wait till we see what the morphology is before we drive on it. Uh, AML prognostics. Let's see what the cytogenetics comes back as before you do fish, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things one can do. Um, we, we see a lot of people who draw plasma cell fish, but it turns out the pl patient doesn't have a plasma cell disorder. You know, so why did we do plasma cell fish? But we've drawn the specimen in case that we need to have it. Real life example, this is an average size hospital on the East Coast, for the, and the data is I said year to date, I meant to say through the first half of 2014, and looking at the send and hold data for chromosome and fish studies, and basically about half of the chromosome and fish studies were canceled using that send and hold approach. And although those dollars may look small, for an average size hospital, those are real dollars. There's really multiple types of algorithms that one can develop. They may be IT driven where we need clinical input, they may be laboratory owned, or it may be for those high cost manual things, a pathologist or on the hereditary side of things, a genetic counselor can really drive those algorithms. And what it really comes down to, if you think about this is what I call the test life cycle process, the utilization efforts have to really focus either at the time of order or once the specimen gets to the laboratory. At the time of order, 
you're really talking about an IT solution, whereas when it gets to the laboratory, it often is a manual solution because we're looking at those high cost, low volume type tests. So we went through this process with our clinical colleagues. It was a wonderful process. We identified opportunities, gathered data, worked together. We achieved consensus, and consensus is not always pretty. It's not always smooth and easy. Uh, but you, you develop those guidelines, put the processes in place, and always look back and see, did it work or not? Did it achieve what we wanted to do? So this slide that I got from Dr. Curtin really describes this process. The physician sees the patient, generates that differential diagnosis, orders the test that they think is appropriate for that patient. Uh, in a bone marrow type situation or a lymph node situation, reviewing the morphology, revising that differential based on what you see and what you know at that point in time, and the right algorithm being consulted and the test order refined. We've accomplished a lot. We want to share as many of these as we can today. This is just an example of one. I'm not going to walk through it. I think Dr. He will share with you, this with you later. Example in a myeloproliferative neoplasm and how we approach it. And has it worked? Well, here's an example. This is 2013 data. We don't have the 2014 data yet. It really talks, this, these are the tests that have been requested by clinicians, but going through this algorithm process, the changes in orders that were made, and as you can see, real savings were accomplished by using this process. Is it applicable outside of Mayo Clinic Rochester? Well, when we, uh, we worked with another hospital, and if we look at Mayo Rochester, chromosomes are done in about 50% of our bone marrows. And of the 100 bone marrows that get done, you know, 50 get chromosomes. But out of, the out of those 100 bone marrows, about 20 of them have chromosomal abnormalities. Hospital C were, was doing chromosome studies in virtually all of their bone marrows, but had an identical abnormality rate. They went through the process of implementing similar guidelines that worked for their institution, and indeed their utilization of, the, of ordering chromosomes dropped significantly, yet their abnormality rate didn't budge. Didn't budge. So in other words, it really shows that you can apply these guidelines outside of Rochester and can really be used in the community as well. And to this institution, it was a significant amount of savings. We also worked in this, there's a, a, a collaborative going on with United Health with their, one of their subsidiaries called Optum, and we created between Mayo and them an entity called Optum Labs. This is populated with, I think it's something like 100 million or 150 million patient lives years in this database, and it's, it, there's a variety of contributors to this database from around the country. We looked at using our, our bone marrow algorithms, in particular with flow cytometry and chromosome studies, and ran it through this database and as to what was being ordered in the community versus what was being ordered in Mayo. The differential was approximately $1,200 per case, and when you go through the prevalence of bone marrow biopsies in this country, what that really comes down to, if you put it in insurance speak, about $267,000 per 100,000 lives, which is, for the payers of the world, it's a huge, it's a huge number. So what my goal was today in this first talk was really to set the stage and uh, to lay out that healthcare is changing. We do have utilization issues. It's not just in hematology, it's across the board. There's a variety of tools that we can use to try to get us to that point. And I think we're, again, what we really want to do today is to be able to share what we've done and uh, share with all of you. Um, I'm going to hold on questions for right now and turn it over to the next talk. And then when Paul gets done with his couple talks, then we'll open up and have some questions. 